Chapter Three, Part Two of Winds of Doctrine Studies in Contemporary Opinion by George Santayana. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter Three: The Philosophy of Monsieur Henri Bergson, Part Two. This peculiarity in the terms of the myth carries with it a notable extension in its propriety the social and moral phenomena of human life cannot be used in interpreting life elsewhere without a certain conscious humour this makes the charm of avowed writers of fable their playful travesty and dislocation of things human which would be puerile if they meant to be naturalists render them piquant moralists for they are not really interpreting animals but under the mask of animals maliciously painting men such fables are morally interesting and plausible just because they are psychologically false if aesop could have reported what lions and lambs ants and donkeys really feel and think his poems would have been perfect riddles to the public and they would have had no human value except that of illustrating to the truly speculative philosopher the irresponsible variety of animal consciousness and its incommensurable types now m bergson's psychological fictions being drawn from what is rudimentary in man have a better chance of being literally true beyond man indeed what he asks us to do and wishes to do himself is simply to absorb so completely the aspect and habit of things that the soul of them may take possession of us that we may know by intuition the elan vital which the world expresses just as paolo and dante knew by intuition the elan vital that the smile of francesca expressed the correctness of such an intuition however rests on a circumstance which m bergson does not notice because his psychology is literary and not scientific it rests on the possibility of imitation when the organism observed and that of the observer have a similar structure and can imitate one another the idea produced in the observer by intent contemplation is like the experience present to the person contemplated but where this contagion of attitude and therefore of feeling is impossible our intuition of our neighbour's souls remains subjective and has no value as a revelation psychological novelists when they describe people such as they themselves are or might have been may describe them truly but beyond that limit their personages are merely plausible that is such as might be conceived by an equally ignorant reader in the presence of the same external indications so for instance the judgment which the superficial traveller passes on foreign manners or religions is plausible to him and to his compatriots just because it represents the feeling that such manifestations awaken in strangers and does not attempt to convey the very different feeling really involved for the natives had the latter been discovered and expressed the traveller's book would have found little understanding and no sale in his own country this plausibility to the ignorant is present in all spontaneous myth nothing more need be demanded of irresponsible fiction which makes no pretensions to be a human document but is merely a human entertainment now a human psychology even of the finest grain when it is applied to the interpretation of the soul of matter or of the soul of the whole universe obviously yields a view of the irresponsible and subjective sort for it is not based on any close similarity between the observed and the observer man and the ether man and cosmic evolution cannot mimic one another to discover mutually how they feel but just because merely human such an interpretation may remain always plausible to man and it would be an admirable entertainment if there were no danger that it should be taken seriously the idea paul has of peter spinoza observes expresses the nature of peter less than it betrays that of paul and so an idea framed by a man of the consciousness of things in general reveals the mind of that man rather than the mind of the universe but the mind of the man too may be worth knowing and the elusive hope of discovering everything may lead him truly to disclose himself such a disclosure of the lower depths of man by himself is m bergson's psychology and the psychological romance 
purporting to describe the inward nature of the universe which he has built out of that introspection is his metaphysics many a point in this metaphysics may seem strange fantastic and obscure and so it really is when dislocated and projected metaphysically but not one will be found to be arbitrary not one but is based on attentive introspection and perception of the immediate take for example what is m bergson's starting point his somewhat dazzling doctrine that to be is to last or rather to feel oneself endure this is a hypostasis of true that is immediately felt duration in a sensuous daydream past feelings survive in the present images of the long ago are shuffled together with present sensations the roving imagination leaves a bright wake behind it like a comet and pushes a rising wave before it like the bow of a ship all is fluidity continuity without identity novelty without surprise hence too the doctrine of freedom the images that appear in such a daydream are often congruous in character with those that preceded and mere prolongations of them but this prolongation itself modifies them and what develops is in no way deducible or predictable out of what exists this situation is perfectly explicable scientifically the movement of consciousness will be self-congruous and sustained when it rests on continual processes in the same tissues and yet quite unpredictable from within because the direct sensuous report of bodily processes in nausea for instance or in hunger contains no picture of their actual mechanism even wholly new features due to little crises in bodily life may appear in a dream to flow out of what already exists yet freely develop it because in dreams comparison the attempt to be consistent is wholly in abeyance and also because the new feature will come embedded in others which are not new but have dramatic relevance in the story so immediate consciousness yields the two factors of bergsonian freedom continuity and indetermination again take the somewhat disconcerting assertion that movement exists when there is nothing that moves and no space that it moves through in vision perhaps it is not easy to imagine a consciousness of motion without some presentation of a field and of a distinguishable something in it but if we descend to somatic feelings and the more we descend with m bergson the closer we are to reality in shooting pains or the sense of intestinal movements the feeling of a change and of a motion is certainly given in the absence of all idea of a mobile or of distinct points or even of a separate field through which it moves consciousness begins with the sense of change and the terms of the felt process are only qualitative limits bred out of the felt process itself even a more paradoxical tenet of our philosophers finds its justification here he says that the units of motion are indivisible that they are acts so that to solve the riddle about achilles and the tortoise we need no mathematics of the infinitesimal but only to ask achilles how he accomplishes the feat achilles would reply that in so many strides he would do it and we may be surprised to learn that these strides are indivisible so that apparently achilles could not have stumbled in the middle of one and taken only half of it of course in nature in what non bergsonians call reality he could but not in his immediate feeling for if he had stumbled the real stride that which he was aware of taking would have been complete at the stumbling point it is certain that consciousness comes in stretches in breaths all its data are aesthetic wholes like visions or snatches of melody and we should never be aware of anything were we not aware of something all at once when a man has taught himself and it is a difficult art to revert in this way to rudimentary consciousness and to watch himself live he will be able if he likes to add a plausible chapter to speculative psychology he has unearthed in himself the animal sensibility which has thickened budded and crystallized into his present somewhat intellectual image of the world he has touched again the vegetative stupor the multiple disconnected landscapes the blooming buzzing confusion which his reason has partly set in order 
may he not have in all this a key to the consciousness of other creatures animal psychology and sympathy with the general life of nature are vitiated both for naturalists and for poets by the human terms they must use terms which presuppose distinctions which non-human beings probably have not made these distinctions correct the illusions of immediate appearance in ways which only a long and special experience has imposed upon us and they should not be imported into other souls we are old men trying to sing the loves of children we are wingless bipeds trying to understand the gods but the data of the immediate are hardly human it is probable that at that level all sentience is much alike from that common ground our imagination can perhaps start safely and follow such hints as observation furnishes until we learn to live and feel as other living things do or as nature may live and feel as a whole instinct for instance need not be as our human prejudice suggests a rudimentary intelligence it may be a parallel sort of sensibility an imageless awareness of the presence and character of other things with a superhuman ability to change oneself so as to meet them do we not feel something of this sort ourselves in love in art in religion m bergson is a most delicate and charming poet on this theme and a plausible psychologist his method of accumulating and varying his metaphors and leaving our intuition to itself under that artful stimulus is the only judicious and persuasive method he could have employed and his knack at it is wonderful we recover as we read the innocence of the mind it seems no longer impossible that we might like the wise men in the story-books learn the language of birds we share for the moment the siestas of plants and we catch the quick consciousness of the waves of light vibrating at inconceivable rates each throb forgotten as the next follows upon it and we may be tempted to play on shakespeare and say like as the waves make towards the pebbled shore so do their spirits hasten to their end some reader of m bergson may say to himself all this is ingenious introspection and divination grant that it is true and how does that lead to a new theory of the universe you have been studying surface appearances and the texture of primitive consciousness that is a part of the internal rumble of this great engine of the world how should it loosen or dissolve that engine as your philosophy evidently professes that it must that nature exists we perceive whenever we resume our intellectual and practical life interrupted for a moment by this interesting reversion to the immediate the consciousness which in introspection we treat as an object is in operation a cognitive activity it demonstrates the world you would never yourself have conceived the minds of ethereal vibrations or of birds or of ants or of men suspending their intelligence if you had known of no men ants birds or ether it is the material objects that suggest to you their souls and teach you how to conceive them how then should the souls be substituted for the bodies and abolish them poor guileless reader if philosophers were straightforward men of science adding each his might to the general store of knowledge they would all substantially agree and while they might make interesting discoveries they would not herald each his new transformation of the whole universe but philosophers are either revolutionists or apologists and some of them like m bergson are revolutionists in the interests of apologetics their art is to create some surprising inversion of things some system of the universe contrary to common apprehension or to defend some such inverted system propounded by poets long ago and perhaps consecrated by religion it would not require a great man to say calmly men birds even ether waves if you will feel after this and this fashion the greatness and the excitement begin when he says your common sense your practical intellect your boasted science have entirely deceived you see what the real truth is instead so m bergson is bent on telling us that the immediate as he describes it is the sole reality all else is unreal artificial and a more or less convenient symbol in discourse discourse itself being taken of course for a movement in immediate sensibility which is what it is existentially but never for an excursion into an independent logical realm which is what it is spiritually and in intent 
so we must revise all our psychological observations and turn them into metaphysical dogmas it would be nothing to say simply for immediate feeling the past is contained in the present movement is prior to that which moves spaces are many disconnected and incommensurable events are indivisible wholes perception is in its object and identical with it the future is unpredictable the complex is bred out of the simple and evolution is creative its course being obedient to a general tendency or groping impulse not to any exact law no we must say instead in the universe at large the whole past is preserved bodily in the present duration is real and space is only imagined all is motion and there is nothing substantial that moves times are incommensurable men birds and waves are nothing but the images of them our perceptions like their spirits being some compendium of these images chance intervenes in the flux but evolution is due to an absolute effort which exists in vacuo and is simplicity itself in this effort without having an idea of what it pursues nevertheless produces it out of nothing the accuracy or the hollowness of m bergson's doctrine according as we take it for literary psychology or for natural philosophy will appear clearly in the following instance any one he writes who has ever practised literary composition knows very well that after he has devoted long study to the subject collected all the documents and taken all his notes one thing more is needful before he can actually embark on the work of composition namely an effort often a very painful one to plant himself all at once in the very heart of the subject and to fetch from as profound a depth as possible the momentum by which he needs simply let himself be borne along in the sequel this momentum as soon as it is acquired carries the mind forward along a path where it recovers all the facts it had gathered together and a thousand other details besides the momentum develops and breaks up of itself into particulars that might be retailed ad infinitum the more he advances the more he finds he will never have exhausted the subject and nevertheless if he turns round suddenly to face the momentum he feels at his back and see what it is it eludes him for it is not a thing but a direction of movement and though capable of being extended indefinitely it is simplicity itself this is evidently well observed heighten the tone a little and you might have a poem on those joyful pangs of gestation and parturition which are not denied to a male animal it is a description of the sensation of literary composition of the immediate experience of a writer as words and images rise into his mind he cannot summon his memories explicitly for he would first have to remember them to do so his consciousness of inspiration of literary creation is nothing but a consciousness of pregnancy and of a certain direction of movement as if he were being wafted in a balloon and just in its moments of highest tension his mind is filled with mere expectancy and mere excitement without images plans or motives and what guides it is inwardly as m bergson says simplicity itself yet excellent as such a description is psychologically it is a literary confession rather than a piece of science for scientific psychology is a part of natural history and when in nature we come upon such a notable phenomenon as this that some men write and write eloquently we should at once study the antecedents and the conditions under which this occurs we should try by experiment if possible to see what variations in the result follow upon variations in the situation at once we should begin to perceive how casual and superficial are those data of introspection which m bergson's account reproduces does that painful effort for instance occur always is it the moral source as he seems to suggest of the good and miraculous fruits that follow not at all such an effort is required only when the writer is overworked or driven to express himself under pressure in the spontaneous talker or singer in the orator surpassing himself and overflowing with eloquence there is no effort at all only facility and joyous undirected abundance 
we should further ask whether all the facts previously gathered are recovered and all correctly and what relation the thousand other details have to them and we should find that everything was controlled and supplied by the sensuous endowment of the literary man his moral complexion and his general circumstances and we should perceive at the same time that the momentum which to introspection was so mysterious was in fact the discharge of many automatisms long imprinted on the system a system as growth and disease show that has its internal vegetation and crises of maturity to which facility and error in the recovery of the past and creation also are closely attached thus we should utterly refuse to say that this momentum was capable of being extended indefinitely or was simplicity itself it may be a good piece of literary psychology to say that simplicity precedes complexity for it precedes complexity in consciousness consciousness dwindles and flares up most irresponsibly so long as its own flow alone is regarded and it continually arises out of nothing which indeed is simplicity itself but it does not arise without real conditions outside which cannot be discovered by introspection nor divined by that literary psychology which proceeds by imagining what introspection might yield in others there is a deeper mystification still in this passage where a writer is said to plant himself in the very heart of the subject the general tenor of m bergson's philosophy warrants us in taking this quite literally to mean that the field from which inspiration draws its materials is not the man's present memory nor even his past experience but the subject itself which that experience and this memory regard in other words what we write about and our latent knowledge are the same thing when shakespeare was composing his antony and cleopatra for instance he planted himself in the very heart of rome and of egypt and in the very heart of the queen of egypt herself what he had gathered from plutarch and from elsewhere was according to m bergson's view a sort of glimpse of the remote reality itself as if by telepathy he had been made to witness some part of it or rather as if the scope of his consciousness had been suddenly extended in one direction so as to embrace and contain bodily a bit of that outlying experience thus when the poet sifts his facts and sets his imagination to work at unifying and completing them what he does is to pierce to egypt rome and the inner consciousness of cleopatra to fetch thence the profound momentum which is to guide him in composition and it is there not in the adventitious later parts of his own mind that he should find the thousand other details which he may add to the picture here again in an exaggerated form we have a transcript of the immediate a piece of really wonderful introspection spoiled by being projected into a theory of nature which it spoils in its turn doubtless shakespeare in the heat of dramatic vision lived his characters transported himself to their environment and felt the passion of each as we do in a dream dictating their unpremeditated words but all this is an imagination it is true only within the framework of our dream in reality of course shakespeare never pierced to rome nor to egypt his elaborations of his data are drawn from his own feelings and circumstances not from those of cleopatra this transporting oneself into the heart of a subject is a loose metaphor the best one can do is to transplant the subject into one's own heart and draw from oneself impulses as profound as possible with which to vivify tradition and make it over in one's own image yet i fear that to speak so is rationalism and would be found to involve to the horror of our philosopher that life is cognitive and spiritual but dependent discontinuous and unsubstantial what he conceives instead is that consciousness is a stuff out of which things are made and has all the attributes even the most material of its several objects and that there is no possibility of knowing save by becoming what one is trying to know so perception for him lies where its object does and is some part of it memory is the past experience itself somehow shining through into the present and shakespeare's cleopatra i should infer would have to be some part of cleopatra herself in those moments when she spoke english it is hard to be a just critic of mysticism because mysticism can never do itself justice in words 
to conceive of an external actual cleopatra and an external actual mind of shakespeare is to betray the cause of pure immediacy and i suspect that if m bergson heard of such criticisms as i am making he would brush them aside as utterly blind and scholastic as the mystics have always said that god was not far from them but dwelt in their hearts meaning this pretty literally so this mystical philosophy of the immediate which talks sometimes so scientifically of things and with such intimacy of knowledge feels that these things are not far from it but dwell literally in its heart the revelation and the sentiment of them if it be thorough is just what the things are the total aspects to be discerned in a body are that body and the movement of those aspects when you enact it is the spirit of that body and at the same time a part of your own spirit to suppose that a man's consciousness either one's own or other people's is a separate fact over and above the shuffling of the things he feels or that these things are anything over and above the feeling of them which exists more or less everywhere in diffusion that for the mystic is to be once for all hopelessly intellectual dualistic and diabolical if you cannot shed the husk of those dead categories space matter mind truth person life is shut out of your heart and the mystic who always speaks out of experience is certainly right in this that a certain sort of life is shut out by reason the sort that reason calls dreaming or madness but he forgets that reason too is a kind of life and that of all the kinds mystical passionate practical aesthetic intellectual with their various degrees of light and heat the life of reason is that which some people may prefer i confess i am one of these and i am not inclined even if i were able to reproduce m bergson's sentiments as he feels them he is his own perfect expositor all a critic can aim at is to understand these sentiments as existing facts and to give them the place that belongs to them in the moral world to understand in most cases is intimacy enough herbert spencer says somewhere that the yolk of an egg is homogeneous the highly heterogeneous bird being differentiated in it by the law of evolution i cannot think what assured spencer of this homogeneity in the egg except the fact that perhaps it all tasted alike which might seem good proof to a pure empiricist leibniz on the contrary maintained that the organization of nature was infinitely deep every part consisting of an endless number of discrete elements here we may observe the difference between good philosophy and bad the idea of leibniz is speculative and far outruns the evidence but it is speculative in a well-advised penetrating humble and noble fashion while the idea of spencer is foolishly dogmatic it is a piece of ignorant self-sufficiency like that insular empiricism that would deny that chinamen were real until it had actually seen them nature is richer than experience and wider than divination and it is far rasher and more arrogant to declare that any part of nature is simple than to suggest the sort of complexity that perhaps it might have m bergson however is on the side of spencer after studiously examining the egg on every side for he would do more than taste it and considering the source and destiny of it he would summon his intuition to penetrate to the very heart of it to its spirit and then he would declare that this spirit was a vital momentum without parts and without ideas and was simplicity itself he would add that it was the free and original creator of the bird because it is of the essence of spirit to bestow more than it possesses and to build better than it knows undoubtedly actual spirit is simple and does not know how it builds but for that very reason actual spirit does not really create or build anything but merely watches now with sympathetic now with shocked attention what is being created and built for it doubtless new things are always arising new islands new persons new philosophies but that the real cause of them should be simpler than they that their creator if i may use this language should be ignorant and give more than he has who can stomach that let us grant however since the thing is not abstractly inconceivable that eggs really have no structure to what then shall we attribute the formation of birds will it follow that evolution or differentiation or the law of the passage from the 
homogeneous to the heterogeneous or the dialectic of the concept of pure being or the impulse towards life or the vocation of spirit is what actually hatches them alas these words are but pedantic and rhetorical cloaks for our ignorance and to project them behind the facts and regard them as presiding from thence over the course of nature is a piece of the most deplorable scholasticism if eggs are really without structure the true causes of the formation of birds are the last conditions whatever they may be that introduce that phenomenon and determine its character the type of the parents the act of fertilization the temperature or whatever else observation might find regularly to precede and qualify that new birth in nature these facts if they were the ultimate and deepest facts in the case would be the ultimate and only possible terms in which to explain it they would constitute the mechanism of reproduction and if nature were no finer than that in its structure science could go no deeper than that in its discoveries and although it is frivolous to suppose that nature ends in this way at the limits of our casual apprehension and has no hidden roots yet philosophically that would be as good a stopping-place as any other ultimately we should have to be satisfied with some factual conjunction and method in events if atoms and their collisions by any chance were the ultimate and inmost facts discoverable they would supply the explanation of everything in the only sense in which anything existent can be explained at all if somebody then came to us enthusiastically and added that the will of the atoms so to be and move was the true cause or the will of god that they should move so he would not be reputed i suppose to have thrown a bright light on the subject end of chapter three part two recording by expatriate in bangor maine